we've had Patrick up here for our North Coast Society chats before, and uh, he is one of our favorites without a doubt. So thanks for every, everybody for being so patient while we figured out what the heck was going on um, from one coast to the other. And we're just gonna go ahead and get started, okay? So um, I'm just gonna say a couple of quick little things about the AIA, um, and then I'll hand it over to Nikki who will then introduce our, our guest speaker for us today, okay? So um, thanks for coming today. And this is our first lecture for um, 2021. Last year, obviously, um, year was a little challenging. Um, so this is our first uh, virtual AIA lecture. And well, you can see how it all started out. All right, so my name is Michelle Hughes-Markovich and I'm the president of our local chapter. Um, and the name of our chapter is the North Coast Society. So on behalf of myself and uh, Nikki Slovak, who you can also see there, um, she's our program coordinator. I would like to extend you all a, a warm virtual welcome today. So this is our first lecture of the year. Uh, we will have another one in the fall. And this lecture, of course, is made possible and sponsored through the Archaeological Institute of America. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it. Um, it's the largest and oldest uh, organization in the US that's devoted to all things archaeology. The Institute itself is a nonprofit group that was founded way back in 1879. And today we have over 200,000 members. Uh, we have over 100 local societies, um, the North Coast Society, us, that's one of those, but we also have chapters uh, across the globe, so in Canada and um, in other, all, all other places. Um, the AIA, what it does is we promote archaeological inquiry and public understanding of the material record of the human past. And the reason that we do this is in order to foster an appreciation of diverse cultures and of our shared humanity. AIA supports archaeologists. Um, and it, and us, obviously, so it supports archaeologists, the ethical practice of archaeology, our research, and its dissemination. Um, so one of the big parts of AIA is actually our educational part, and this is something that we have the most fun doing, I think, getting to tell other people about what kinds of things we do as archaeologists, and so we get to educate people of all ages, and we get to also advocate for the preservation of world heritage. So if you are interested, and I think you must be if you're here, um, I urge you to go to our website or to visit any of, uh, that was good timing, any of the social media accounts that just popped up there on the screen. Um, that would be fantastic. Come and support our work. Uh, maybe take part in some field work, get yourself an archaeology journal, um, and support the AIA. All right, so one last thing before we begin today, I truly really wanted to give a big uh, thank you to AIA's wonderful Laurel Sparks and Laura Rich, who um, you guys all heard at the beginning trying to help us figure out what the heck was going on. There's no way we could have done it without them. So I just wanted to give uh, a shout out to those two and say thank you very much. Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nikki Slovak, our program coordinator. Thanks, Nikki. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm so excited to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Um, I had the pleasure of knowing him when, when we were both at Stanford University and also had the great pleasure of welcoming him to the Santa Rosa Junior College campus a few years ago where he spoke about Utsi the Iceman and it was phenomenal. So I'm looking forward to tonight's talk. Um, Dr. Patrick Hunt is with the Center for Medieval and Early Modern Studies at Stanford University the Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies at UCLA, and the School of Cultural Diplomacy in London, the Frome Institute in San Francisco, and the Institute of Ethnomedicine. He holds a PhD from the Institute of Archaeology, University of London, and has also studied at the University of California at Berkeley and the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. His research interests are alpine archaeology, archaeological science, archaeometry, geoarchaeology, forensic archaeology, Roman archaeology, Celtic archaeology, and Hannibal studies. He does a lot. <laughs> His main publications include Alpine Archaeology in 2007 and 10 Discoveries that re Rewrote History also in 2007, as well as numerous articles and encyclopedia entries. And his most recent book is Hannibal. So we are going to hear about Hannibal and Hannibal's secret weapon. Um, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions um, as we go. I would ask that 
Um, if you could post your questions to the chat window, Michelle and I will keep track of that throughout the lecture. And we'll have some time after Dr. Hunt's talk um, to field some of those questions to him. And also one question that did come up already was about recording the lecture. So it is prohibited by AIA to record the lectures, but do know that this will be available on the AIA's website um, at some point soon following the talk. So um, please uh, do not record the lecture. I appreciate that. Okay, without further ado, in this strange, chaotic, weird way <laughs> of 2021, please give a virtual welcome uh, to Dr. Patrick Hunt. All right, well, thank you uh, both Michelle and Nikki. It's a pleasure to be with you again. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, your vibrant society there uh, in Santa Rosa a few years ago. And uh, the question and answer period was phenomenal because uh, there were such wonderfully intelligent questions and I don't always receive those. Um, now, uh, I'm also, uh, as Nikki knows, uh, uh, president of the Stanford Society, where she came and spoke to us a year or so ago, actually two years now, uh, we don't even count 2020, do we, uh, on uh, Peruvian uh, mummies. And Michelle, we have to rectify uh, uh, the fact that we haven't had you come, so that's going to come soon too. And we're th really thrilled uh, to be able to do this. Uh, Zoom lectures, it is amazing, isn't it, that we can actually have virtual material. Uh, I haven't been outside the country for over a year, like probably all of you, which is unusual because in my work for National Geographic, I usually travel about 100,000 miles a year, uh, racking up those air miles. Not 2020. I uh, haven't been on a plane since February 2020. And uh, yet, by Zoom, it is interesting. I've been able to give quite a few international lectures this year uh, in Canada, in Toronto, in Munich, in London. Uh, and the good thing about Zoom lectures around the world is you don't have to uh, have travel costs and there's no jet lag. Uh, so as long as the time calendar syncs up uh, with time zones, everything is good. So thank you. And I'm, as I said, very excited to be with you again. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because we're gonna go through a, a fair amount of slides tonight. Uh, so I'd rather have you see them uh, than me anyway. Uh, well, I do appear in a few of these. Uh, and this uh, talk is Hannibal's Secret Weapon, uh, and it does come out of the book uh, that Nikki mentioned, uh, Hannibal. Uh, but uh, interestingly, I'm going to also talk a little bit about Hannibal developed the secret weapon by, by his alpine crossing first. So we'll look a little bit at that. And I think uh, we are recording correctly now. Is that true? Uh, let's just let's just see. Uh, yes, I think if we haven't, let's start this now. To it's record. recording, Patrick. Okay. I've got it. Good. All right. So uh, thank you. And uh, with Hannibal's secret weapon, uh, it is interesting. It it doesn't seem that it should be that secret, uh, but uh, remember that uh, he mostly uh, beat the Romans over and over and over again. Uh, with smaller armies. And it, it sort of runs true to that idea that uh, Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, uh, essentially uh, would vivify the dictum that uh, it's not how large your army is, it's how good your army is that counts in the ancient world. And uh, I found that uh, having been working in the Alps for many years, uh, an astrographic approached me uh, many years ago now and asked me if I would apply for a grant for uh, the Hannibal research in the Alps with the scientific uh, uh, parameters. And um, I was eager to do it uh, until I saw that it was a 40 page application. I said, oh, I don't think this is, this is like the Fulbright. This is way, 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 way too much time to do this. And so I said, I, I think I'm probably not going to, you know, apply for a grant. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. They said, we'll give you the short form. <laughs> it was only 10 pages long. So I, I went ahead uh, and did it. And I, of course, uh, I kick myself now uh, for not starting a little sooner uh, with National Geographic, but I've been with them now for well over a decade. And uh as an explorer, learning uh, explorer and expeditions expert. And I'm really grateful because uh, it's humbling uh, when you consider how many years I read Nat Geo as a kid. We had sets that went back to the basically 1890s. 
and I never dreamt that I would be a National Geographic um, expeditions expert or explorer, and it did happen. And that's, uh, as Nikki knows, uh, the years I taught Hannibal at Stanford and took a lot of Stanford students and Berkeley students and students from all over the world uh, on these expeditions tracking Hannibal. So uh, in the process, uh, they were the sponsor, Nat Geo sponsored the project for quite a few years uh, and uh, with Stanford and uh, with AIA too. So um, uh, this is one of the images in a, a California history textbook. Uh, it just says I'm an astrographic explorer in search of Hannibal's route. And even though the graphics don't always work, where I'm uh, kind of laying down on the ground, uh, literally at about eight and a half thousand, nine thousand feet in a pass, looking at a geological map. Because if you don't know the geology of a region, you won't understand the weathering of the architecture, the materials, the landscape. Uh, you won't understand um, the geomorphology. Uh, how that landscape changes over time. So geology is really important. Physical science is very important in archaeology. And my own background in the archaeological science included geomorphology, geology, climatology, paleoclimatology, uh, palynology, uh, soil science, um, and anything related to the geology and chemistry, the soil chemistry. So that was important. And by the way, the valley I am in, in this picture, is a mile long and half a mile wide, and it could easily accommodate a sleeping army. Right at the summit, because you can see the actual summit pass right behind me, that little uh, sort of uh, scrabble uh, talus ridge behind me, and then it drops off a good thousand feet pretty quickly after that, and then drops down into Italy. So that's the border right there between France and Italy. So you're sort of looking south, but if you stand on that ridge, and look east, you can see all the way to Torino, which is an important criterion uh, from Polybius, the general that we count on. Uh, and like Polybius, I really believe that uh, you shouldn't write or talk about a place. You shouldn't uh, try to uh, in any way understand a place without being there. It's feet on the ground. And that's really important in archaeology, as Michelle and Nikki know uh, just as well as I do. Topography is something you, you can't really get from reading an ancient text as much as you can by standing there and looking around. Even with VR uh, and all the technical uh, assistance we have today. So in search of Hannibal's route, that was really important. Uh, so uh, this is the book that came out of much of that research. It took a good 10 years to write, which the publisher wasn't real happy about, uh, but I kept going back and doing additional field work. And the book has been uh, really, for me, a milestone. Uh, I guess it's been a, a modest academic bestseller. It's in five languages now. Uh, and and I, I'm actually, uh, although one shouldn't be proud, I'm more humbled by it. But uh, I am pleased that both National Geographic and Simon and & Schuster and AIA really got behind this research. Without them, uh, the, the questions uh, that were raised in the fieldwork could not have been addressed. And so the secret weapon idea comes out uh, of this book. Uh, now, when Hannibal crossed the Alps, remember it was in basically early winter, uh, late October, early November, because winter comes early uh, in the Alps. The Celts, the mountain Celts or Gauls, uh, Celto is the Greek version, Gaul is the Latin version. Uh, they had never seen elephants before and they stayed away from the elephants. Uh, they attacked uh, Hannibal's convoy at multiple places and times. They ambushed him twice, but they never got near the elephants. Elephants uh, ha have a funky smell that horses don't like. And we don't know what the Celts thought. They might have thought that these elephants looked like gigantic boulders sort of rumbling across the landscape. But Hannibal uh, took advantage of that fact that all of his Spanish silver from the Carthaginian silver mines, the Iberian silver, he had loaded on the back of those elephants. So that was really necessary to pay for his intelligence, his military intel, and to buy uh, materials when he couldn't uh, uh, get it otherwise. Uh, so it was really important uh, that, that Hannibal silver resource, the, the coins that were minted by his dynasty there in Spain, Iberia at the time, uh, helped him to do things that no one had ever done before. And literally, you could say that much of what we call military intelligence 
uh, was pioneered by, by Hannibal and a few of his predecessors, but Hannibal gets a lot of the credit uh, because he could pay for uh, renegade Celts. Uh, he could also pay for people who worked in the Roman uh, camps uh, to get him information about the generals, the leaders, their foibles, their weaknesses. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, that, that silver was really critical to his success. When the silver flow stopped, once Scipio Africanus took over Carthage, Hannibal's successes stopped too. And that's a, a vital clue. But you can imagine these, these elephants. Everybody remembers the elephants over the Alps. It's strange, but even Juvenal, the Roman poet, predicted that what Hannibal would be remembered for was leading elephants over the Alps, which seems uh, really difficult and, and kind of uh, uh, counterintuitive, uh, and yet it's this, this strange phenomenon that people remember most about Hannibal. Now, there have been all kinds of cartoons. Uh, here you can see the Romans at a sort of alpine pass gate, uh, sort of a toll gate there, uh, post five, and they're saying, uh-oh, here comes trouble, because Hannibal brought 37 elephants and probably between 25 to 40,000 soldiers. But this was a really difficult, difficult ascent and descent. The de descent was even more difficult. And as I said, the, the Celts ambushed him, those mountain <laughs> tribes ambushed him. Uh, and while he lost a lot of soldiers and pack animals, we don't know how many elephants were lost, uh, but 37 at least made it over into Italy. And Hannibal learned a lot from this experience of going over the Alps in winter. In fact, he replicated some of these circumstances in his own battles. The Romans never expected Hannibal to come over the Alps. They expected him to wait out the winter and come down around uh, basically the, where the coast of Italy and France meet uh, down between Nice uh, and uh, Geno and all that. Uh, now, silly things, I know it's a little, you know, this is silly to show you this image, but uh, there is this a Spike TV series that was called Deadliest Warrior, and they invited me to be the Hannibal expert. And they even photoshopped me into the picture as Hannibal. And they told me to look grim, uh, look foreboding. Uh, and uh, I tried. Uh, but uh, uh, even my freshman students at Stanford had seen this series, uh, and some of them were excited that what they'd seen on Spike TV uh, now. Uh, they were able to even, some of them even come with me tracking Hannibal in the Alps. So the silly things we do, but we learned some things doing this. I met an African elephant named Susie, and I'll talk about Susie in a minute, because she was vital to understanding uh, some of the, uh, the pachyderm supply. Now, of course, notice that in the Second Punic War, basically, uh, you could say 218 or 219 BCE to 202 BCE, Rome is landlocked here. It, it controls the Italian peninsula and very worried about the proximity of Carthage to uh, Sicily, which they took from Carthage in the First Punic War from essentially 264 to 241 BCE, because it was too close for comfort. And yet, uh, in doing so, uh, Hamilcar Barca, Hannibal's father, uh, never lost a, a battle, and he was basically cooped up here near Erice between Palermo and today Trapani, and he finally was forced to come home with his army uh, because the Carthaginian Council of Elders said, pack it in, we're done with this battle, we're, we're conceding to the Romans, which they only did after really losing their navy off the Battle of the Gatus Islands uh, in 241, and they signed a very a bad peace treaty with Rome, uh, the Treaty of Lutatius, where they now had to pay a huge penalty, thousands of silver talents to Rome, based on ultimately one battle uh, that losing their navy, which they had that naval superiority before that. And of course, the Romans really wanted the Western Mediterranean. Remember, later on, the Romans renamed this Mare Nostrum, our sea no longer their sea, referring to Carthage's control thereof. And it's this idea that that Rome is building towards empire, Mediterranean domination, uh, but it can't happen until Carthage is out of the way. Hannibal knew that Rome's intent was to destroy Carthage. Uh, he didn't want to destroy Rome. He just wanted to push back to get Rome to leave Carthage alone. And that wasn't in the cards. Rome would never, ever give up, and Rome would never uh, concede uh, uh, even in, after battles where they lost 100,000 men to Hannibal in Italy. 
Now at the time, Rome was pushing into the Po River Valley called the Padana, and they'd set up some colonies, military camps at Cremonum, now Cremona, and uh, uh, Piacenza, uh, then Placentia, uh, and they were taking over Celtic farmland. So the Celts were very unhappy about this, the ones who lived uh, in Northern Italy uh, on the south side of the Alps, and they were calling for help from somebody. Well, Hannibal actually was the one who answered the call because it dovetailed with his own aim uh, to stop Rome. And Rome really had only one way to go, originally north up the peninsula. But of course, they've got their eye on cars for the whole time. And Hamilcar Barca uh, took uh, an army because the Carthaginian council did not want him around. He was too popular. He had stopped the mercenary rebellions. Uh, and by 237, he says, okay, I'll get out of your hair. We need to pay off that war debt. So I'm gonna go to our new colony over here in Iberia. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna go to those silver mines and we'll, we'll build a lot of silver bullion up fast to pay off that treaty fence. But of course, Hamilcar Barca, Hannibal's father had other intentions that he did not disclose. He was building his own war chest because he didn't think this war with Rome was over and he was right. Of course, he kind of instigates the second phase thereof. So Hannibal wanted to be with his father, whom he hadn't seen. He's nine, 10 years old. His father's been in the field the whole time. Hannibal says, dad, can I go with you? Well, Han Hamilcar thought about it and he said, okay, you can go with me if you swear undying hatred to Rome. Never be Rome's friend, be at enmity with them. If you swear to that on the altar of Baal, then I'll take you with me. Now remember, Hannibal means Baal's favored one, the, the grace or favor of Baal. That was the, the, the main uh, god in this pantheon worshiped. Uh, there were different gods, but Baal was really important. So Hannibal, already his life is devoted to Baal from his very naming onward. So he agrees. He puts his hand on the living sacrifice, which may even have been a surrogate for himself, because remember, the Carthaginians did seem to practice whether normative if not, some kind of child sacrifice of their elites to placate or get the, the favor of their gods. So Hannibal may have realized his life is already given to Baal, uh, and he does go with his father. They march with the armies across Northern Africa, which at the time was well watered. There were a lot of rivers uh, in the Atlas Mountains at the time. Uh, it's not so forested today, a drier climate. So they marched across with an army and baby elephants, and they got all the way to the pillars of Hercules, Gibraltar, and they crossed with small ships. And then, of course, they went to the colony. And those elephants were raised uh, in first Iberia. Remember, Iberia is named because it's the land south of the Ebro River, which was called the Eber then. So there were Celt Iberians there, but many of them are mercenaries. And that's one of the big differences. Hannibal's army is a mercenary army. He has Carthaginians, Libyans, Mauritanians, Numidians, uh, uh, Celt Iberians in his army. And they, they basically fight for pay or loot, unlike the Roman army, which is conscripted uh, youths, conscripted farmers, etc., who put down the plowshare and pick up the sword. Uh, but Rome did not really have a professional army. Uh, they, their elites, their officers were often professionals and patricians, but the bulk of their army was untrained until Hannibal, and he, Hannibal's going to change all that. But the professional army of Carthage, these paid-for mercenaries, they may have smaller armies, uh, but they certainly knew how to fight, and they had not incentive to defend their homeland. They had the incentive of booty, loot, and and paid in silver. So Hannibal uh, first takes over the city of Saguntum in 219. He starves it to death, lays siege to it. The Romans are horrified. They send an envoy down to Carthage saying, rein this guy in uh, or, or we're going to be at war again. Uh, and they said, if you cross the Ebro River, the Eber River with an army with arms, that means war. That's the casus belli. That's cause for war. Well, Hannibal went back to Carthage after starving out the Saguntines. Uh, and he raised an army of 90,000 and eventually crossed. He put 10,000 on the south side of the Ebro, 10,000 on the north side, 10,000 uh, up in here. He's guarding his supply chain. He's got to have uh, certain supplies that he can't get uh, across the water because now the Romans control the seas. And he meets with a parley of Gauls somewhere uh, in uh, the area of Banyuls or Aspra around here. And they tell him, please come over. And one tribe, especially the Bowie tribe, who live about right here, 
uh, they, they, they were the people who had a town called Bononia, which is today modern day Bologna. And they were the ones who were suffering the most from the encroachments, the encroachments of the Romans taking over their farmland. So they really told Hannibal, come on over, we'll help you, we'll guide you over. Now this, this dotted line isn't really the right route because he didn't go over the Durante. He went further north because he had to encounter the Allobroges tribe, which were never down here. But he came across the Alps. Uh, and as you can see here, comes out to Turin and the three main battles uh, that he, he won with literally a total of 100,000 Romans perish. The Battle of Trebia here, the Trebia River, the Trasimen Lake Battle here, and then Cannae, the most incredible disaster Rome had ever faced uh, either before or since uh, in terms of uh, uh, the overwhelming defeat. So th this is what we'll talk about today mostly. The secret weapon, and I'll just iterate this uh, again later, but Hannibal's mastery of the environment, using the topography, knowing the topography, he used the environment and the climate and whatever he could in that environment as a weapon because it bolstered his arsenal since he always had a smaller army. army. He used nature as a weapon. He weaponized nature. And literally, ever since in history, people have tried to learn from Hannibal and copy that idea of using the topography, using the environment, weaponizing nature as part of your arsenal. And, and that's what we'll look at in detail uh, in, in the coming time. Now, uh, you, you saw this idea of elephants. Uh, we're told by Polybius that the elephants uh, got on, they were pushed onto rafts. Uh, and uh, many of them jumped off and tried to basically get across the river. Elephants can swim, but if, if they could stand on the ground, and remember in September when they crossed, the river is lower, but they could just put their feet on the ground uh, if they were big enough and put their, their literally their trunks above water. And even though uh, Polybius doesn't say they snorkeled, that's essentially what they did. They snorkeled across the river, the ones that jumped off the rafts. So. Uh, the elephant crossing uh, was important because uh, once Hannibal had crossed the Rhone, he now has to fend off some of the tribes and make his way through the Alps, which is going to take uh, essentially uh, at least a week, nine days over the Alps alone, 15 days uh, from the junction of the Acer Rhone River all the way to Turin. Now, uh, you may think about elephants in the Alps. Do you remember that children's book, Babar? Well, I've been to Saint Moritz many times for Nat Geo because we work there uh, in, in those mountains, tracking uh, snow melt and glacial change and all those things. I've never seen elephants uh, there. Certainly, uh, elephants can't uh, ski because their center of gravity is way too high. Watch out if one starts snowballing toward you, but good luck seeing them. But you know, my kids always asked me growing up, uh, you know, did I ever see elephants in the Alps? Only in the Babar book. Uh, now, however, a good friend of mine, uh, John Hoyt and his uh, partner, Richard Jolly, scientific partner, uh, now Sir Richard Jolly, because he became a huge UNICEF director and now the UN historian, the two of them, when they were at Cambridge University, decided to go to some debates about which pass Hannibal took uh, between uh, some different uh, scholars, Gavin De Beer at the Natural History Museum and uh, uh, Sir George MacDonald and others. And they decided to try themselves. So they went over every Alpine pass that was noted as a possibility. And they concluded that really uh, only one works best with the criteria that Hannibal uh, could have uh, done because Polybius, the the Greek historian followed Hannibal a generation later, but he went with one of Hannibal's veterans who took him across the pass and took him that route. So Polybius, as I said, feet on the ground, wrote about this, but he didn't name the pass, but he did name a lot of the topography uh, places and contexts. So then John and Richard decided they would take an elephant over the Alps. And they went to a zoo. They found a small zoo in Torino, a small Italian zookeeper had a rambunctious adolescent elephant that he really wanted out of his hair for the summer. Uh, uh, and uh, this elephant was, uh, you know, so hyperactive that uh, he felt that the zoo uh, was better off without the elephant. So he said, you can have my elephant, take my elephant, take Jumbo with you over the Alps. 
Uh, and so they said, wow, we've got our elephant, but you know, and then of course, Life Magazine wrote this up. It's a fantastic story. Journalists followed them everywhere, but the Royal Society for the Protection of Animals, RSPA, was really against them taking an elephant with them. Uh, and so they had to make these huge leather boots for the elephant when they considered the sharp rocks possible. Uh, and I've literally uh, seen some of those elephant boots. They're now, uh, they're like umbrella stands uh, and massive. I don't think the elephants really needed them, but they satisfied the RSPA somewhat. And then they found that they needed because of all the the flack they were getting, they underwrote this with an insurance provider. So Lloyd's of London was the insurer that insured the expedition. You can just imagine uh, all the hoop de la and, uh, and so on. Uh, and here they are uh, in the Alps. Uh, it's the British Alpine Hamble Expedition. And you can see uh, here's Richard Jolly at the time, this engineering grad student at Cambridge. And this uh, 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 here is Richard Jolly. Uh, uh, who now is, as I said, Sir Richard, and they had a mahout, they had an elephant trainer. And if you look closely, you can recognize what kind of elephant this is, but we'll look at that. Uh, there, of course, is the elephant going over the Petit Montseny Pass. Uh, and this elephant was so happy to be with them, hiking, had a blast. In fact, this is a picture at the camp, and then at night, can you imagine? They sat down by the campfire, they got out their guitars and they sang Kumbaya and Jumbo the elephant. Have you ever heard an elephant sing? Jumbo kind of droned along with them. Anyway, the elephant sang with them. The elephant had such a good time when the summer was over and they'd crossed all the way to Torino, brought the elephant back. She didn't want to go back. Who would? In fact, the rest of her life, she went to the corner of that compound and looked back up to the Alps all her life long. She had such a good time crossing the Alps. Well, National Graphic asked me if I wanted to take an elephant over the Alps. And I thought of my PETA friends and I thought of the SPCA and I said, mm, let's see what we can do about this. I don't think I better take a, a real elephant, but we, we did something interesting. I'll get to that. Uh, this is Richard Halliburton, the adventure explorer, who took an elephant named Dolly over the Alps, and he went over the Grand San Bernard Pass, which is way too far north and too far to the east. Uh, Hannibal would have to backtrack hundreds of kilometers to do it this way, so it didn't work. But I've worked at that pass for a long time, tracking roads. And one of the things that surprised me and our team over the years was that whatever village we were in, at whatever summit of whatever pass, we went over 35 alpine passes, checking them out to see if they would suffice for Hannibal with the criteria that Polybius writes about. Every village told us Hannibal came through here. Can you imagine 35 different villages at, near the summits of, of mountain passes saying, that Hannibal came through their pass? Well, we knew that couldn't be the case. So with Richard's help and, and with John Hoyt's help, we began eliminating a process of elimination to, to figure out you know, how can we make this work for Polybius? Now, if you look closely, Richard Halliburton here is in kind of a leisure suit. He's not roughing it. And this is right next to the Grand San Bernard Monastery. It, basically uh, 8,200 feet. But look closely at this elephant. If you think this elephant has tusks, it's because he's playing a trick on you. He's wearing white shoes, white pointed shoes, because Dolly is an Asian Elephus Maximus elephant without tusks. Just like Jumbo, if we go back, Jumbo, was an Elephus Maximus, Asian elephant without tusks. But Richard, Richard Halliburton thought it looks more formidable to have an elephant with tusks. So he has pointed white shoes. Isn't that tricky? The photograph barely shows. If you watch, look at his legs, those pointy white shoes at the tips of them. He knew what he was doing, this trickster Richard Halliburton. But let's talk about elephants. What kind of elephants did Hannibal take? Well, Elephus Maximus, the Asian elephant with many sub-varieties, is on the upper left. And what you're seeing here are two female elders and a young elephant. And that's the Asian elephant, Elephus Maximus. The females do not have tusks. 
Now of the African species, Loxodendron africanus, both male and female have tusks and tusks are important because the war elephants, they charge, they gore with the tusks and they trample. And you kind of need all three of those for war elephants. So we know Hannibal had African elephants, but he also had Asian elephants. We don't know if he had genders of both. Hannibal himself rode an Asian elephant called the Syrian, Suros, which had been taken all the way from an enclave of elephants from India when Alexander the Great went to India and then his successors in Seleucids brought Asian elephants to Syria. So they were called Syrian elephants. So Hannibal's personal elephant was an, an Asian male named Suros, the Syrian. But we know he had uh, African elephants with him too from the Nile. Carthage uh, definitely used both. And I want you to look at this real quickly. Uh, the coin that you see in the bottom left, if you look at the difference between these, these elephants, Asian elephants have convex backs, so their spine arches upward. They have small ears. They have a pronounced uh, cerebrum. They have differences in their toes and their trunks too. But look at this elephant on the bottom right. Difference, big ears for the African elephant, a different slope of the cerebrum, certainly the tusks, and uh, a concave back. So if you look at the coins that Hannibal's family, the Barkids, put out, from New Carthage, what kind of elephant is on that coin? It's obviously an African elephant. And you know some of the discrimination and racism uh, uh, even applied to African elephants was saying they're not, they're, they're too wild, they can't be domesticated, they're not smart enough to train for war. Well, I don't know that anybody should be trained for you know, war in that respect. Uh, who of us is naturally inclined to that? But I guarantee you that African uh, elephants were smart enough because when we did that Deadliest Warrior show, uh, the production company borrowed for a while uh, the Hollywood elephant named Susie. And there's Susie, upper left. Boy, she was hungry all the time. She just about consumed every tree branch in Topanga Canyon. She was really, really voracious and she was really smart. She knew over a hundred verbal commands. She's clearly African. Look at the big ears, the back uh, and so on. Maybe you, can, maybe you quite can't see her concave back but you could see her big ears. She was smarter than half the production crew. <laughs> she was really one smart elephant. Uh, so I would never say that African elephants can't be trained. She could have trained me. She was so smart. So clearly, uh, we know that he took both Asian and African and probably a lot of, of Asian male elephants. But in the elephant societies, the women, the females kind of rule the place. So he had to have uh, Asian females in both African and Asian elephant communities. The oldest dominant uh, hierarchy leader is usually uh, the, the grandmother of all the elephants. So women lead in those societies. The men are the outliers, but you need elephants with tusks and for the goring bit. So anyway, uh, I don't want to go into any more of that. But when I spoke at the Harvard Club in, in New York, there's this big elephant head on the wall. And when the ears are flared like that, it means they're gonna charge. And that's an elephant head that was, uh, so, you know, I looked at the little, there, they, there had been a little brass plaque that was missing. And people told me surreptitiously, that's the elephant that Teddy Roosevelt shot. Well, you know, uh, back when safaris and, and all that, uh, uh, that an elephant shoot uh, is permissible. Not now, but the Harvard Club still has that elephant head on the wall. Anyway, that's, you know, what do, you, what do you expect? But uh, probably shot by Teddy Roosevelt. Sad, yes, but anyway. Uh, when National Graphic said, do you want to take an elephant? This is my way around it. I took Stanford offensive line guardsmen who were six foot nine and 300 pounds. That's George Halamandaras, who's an engineer, like you know, quite a few of the Stanford football players, engineers. So there's my elephant, one of them. Uh, we, we, we had our Stanford elephants, uh, usually uh, Stanford football players. Really smart guys, by the way. 
uh, but big. And you know, if I needed help, they carried all the equipment. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to trek, you know, 5,000 you know feet up uh, with our heavy equipment. Uh, and so these guys were happy to be, uh, as it were, pack elephants as well. Now, what kind of guides did Hamill take? Well, the smartest guide we ever had was a dog named Sparky. The only problem with Sparky, if he sees a marmot hole, he goes after the marmot. Uh, but the kind of guides that Hamill had were Celts. Uh, and usually, this is the tribe that opposed him the most, the Alabroge tribe, which were not in the south. They were central Alps, the Cartian Alps. So we know that uh, they ambushed him, and we know that he worked with them uh, with some of them, uh, not always happily, not always voluntarily, but they were the primary tribes that uh, uh, that are in this this route of Hannibal. We, as I said, we went over 35 uh, alpine passes between basically the Col du Tond all the way over to the Dinaric Slovenian Alps, at uh, the Arc of the Alps. And Hannibal, to do this in nine days, uh, uh, he had to go through the Central Alps here and end up in Torino where he uh, uh, burnt down the Tarasi tribe. Now, the, the most direct route we found is the Clapier route, and this is the one that we've published the most. It, it's the most direct, it's high, uh, but it, you have to go above the tree line uh, for this, but you also still have to have foraging for, for elephants. Uh, and this is one of our teams, 37 Stanford athletes. Uh, uh, on this particular route. And we crossed the Rhone River near at Avignon that day. You can see Avignon. And we cycled the entire route from Beaucaire, Avignon, all the way to Modan. But we didn't do it all in one day. We didn't do it all in one year, even different years. Over 12 years, we had different section segments that we cycled. So we've cycled the entire, but we felt it was best to, on our own power, track Hannibal so we could understand the difficulties. Going by car is fairly easy. Going on your own steam is not. Whether we did it on foot or by bicycle, we had to change from city bikes eventually to mountain bikes. Now, the pass at the Clapier goes by this little lake, and the first time we did it was in a blizzard, August 26th, 1996, in a blizzard. And we're coming from France over the pass into Italy. You can see we're on the edge of the blizzard here and all the white caps whipped up by a hundred kilometer an hour wind. It was really fierce. It, the wind was so bad that, uh, and the blizzard was so tough early on that day that the guide, now a good friend, Joel Blay said, Patrick, this is crazy. We're not gonna do this today. This is, this is dangerous. I said, yeah, but Joel, I want to kind of understand how Hannibal did it. And this is the right circumstance. We need snow and ice and wind and wintry conditions. So he relented, especially because we you know, paid him a considerably higher fee. But look at this. The wind was so bad. Can you see it tore our pants? It literally, it ripped our clothes apart if we had uh, gear that wasn't prepared. So we had to duct tape ourselves together. If you look at our legs. Uh, and that's why archaeologists always bring duct tape. You never know how you're going to need it or when, but it's a given that archaeologists have duct tape. Boy, what a lifesaver that was. So uh, there we are crossing that day, uh, and uh, it was a, a rough day, but the wind was at our backs, which was one good thing, uh, but we did cross in a blizzard the first time. Uh, sometimes the, the fog up there is so bad in those Alps that you can't see more than 10 feet away. Uh, and that, by the way, is John Hoyt's son, Jonathan. Remember the first guy who brought the elephant in 1959? That's his son. I've hiked with John Hoyt, his son, Jonathan Hoyt, and others. Uh, we had problems. Sometimes even wolves were around us. Uh, and uh, if the fog lifts, uh, a pack of sheep had gone by. We didn't see them. We only heard them. The fog was so thick. And then we saw where they'd been, you know, little, little blobs everywhere. But the fog lifted, and there was this big shaggy dog hanging over a rock right by where we were sitting for lunch. And some of the students said, oh, look, Professor Hunt, uh, there's, a, there's the sheepdog. I looked at it, and I looked at my assistant, and I said, I didn't tell the students that was a wolf. But the wolves sometimes track with us. And they were, looking, they were going after the sheep. But it can be dangerous up there. We dug 45 different test pits in that valley. You see, that's the summit valley of the Clapier. And we actually found campground ash, little bits of uh, uh, patinated uh, bronze, 
Uh, we think we found Hannibal's camp here. We're pretty sure this is it. We even found uh, 18 rib bones that we we're doing the DNA testing on. That would that be definitive. And even though I think I've got five parameters for proving this is Hannibal's root, not even counting the ash, uh, which is the right level, the right depth, and it's all over the place because there were many, many campfires. They brought wood up from, from uh, the valleys below in France. And uh, the, the snow would not be that thick on the ground here, but once they started down, the snow was really thick. Uh, and uh, that's one of the criteria uh, of Polybius for Hannibal's Pass too. But intriguingly, this is the only pass where there's actually been an elephant tusk found. So we think we've got enough data, but I'm not gonna publish it until I get the DNA results on those bones. Uh, I, you know, some of my colleagues, uh, all, all the time uh, you have competition for these kinds of research questions. And I know people who really prematurely said they found Hannibal's pass and, and they've never been able to prove it. Uh, and uh, they may be looking for elephant dung with the right bacteria in it, but so far they haven't found it. Um, the dung would not survive, but the, the traces would. So anyway, we think we found Hannibal's pass. Now, did he have enough men and right equipment to cross the Alps to take Italy? No, this is part of the learning experience of how he develops this secret weapon. He did not have all the right stuff. He lost 35 to 40% of his army going over, but it taught him the necessary requisites of how also to use the environment against the Romans. He learned from his Alpine crossing how bad winter can be on an army. When he got down to the bottom of the pass into Italy, Polybius says his men and animals were basically reduced to survival. Uh, they were so emaciated. The men were more like beasts. They recuperated. They took Tarazi uh, and the Tarini tribe, Torino's named after them. And then they went further east along the Po River uh, and they had to encounter now the Romans at Placentia, uh, uh, Piacenza today. So Liddell Hart, a great general, said that normal soldiers prefer the known to the unknown. Hannibal was really unusual. He chose to face the most hazardous conditions, like going over the Alps, surprising the Romans because they thought he'd winter it out, rather than meeting his opponents where they chose the battles. Hannibal, for most of the battles, all the ones that he won, and he only lost one at the end, all the battles that Hannibal won, he chose the environment, the context, the timing, and so on. Uh, so he was really a student of topography uh, and nature. Now, so the, the secret weapon, as I said, was weaponizing nature. And let's now look at the, the three most battles in some detail. Here I am at the Trebia River, which actually flows uh, it flows north from the Apennines into the Po River. And this is where the Romans were encamped. They were on the east side and Hannibal's camped on the west side. Now this is in August. Well, it's really hot. You can see uh, it's, it's a pretty hot place in August, but there are shallow spots. And then here looking south along that same Trebia River, the Romans were camped over here near a city called River Garo today. And Hannibal's spies using his silver, his Iberian silver had sussed out that this general wanted to get over quick. He thought he was the superior officer and he was very vain and very full of himself and conceited. And he thought that you know he could easily take Hannibal. Uh, well, Hannibal in a previous encounter skirmish uh, at the Ticino River to the Northeast had already heavily wounded the primary veteran. And the Romans had big mistakes in their logistics this time. They had two consuls, two main generals. One was a military veteran and the other was a political appointee. You can imagine the political appointees can be demagogues, populists. They have the adulation of the plebeians, but they don't have the military experience necessary. So Hannibal took out the military veteran, Scipio's uh, uh, father in this case, Scipio Africanus's father, took him out, heavily wounded, he's laid up, he can't fight. So Hannibal wants to fight this uh, egocentric, full of himself general named uh, Sempronius Longus, uh, who really didn't have the requisite military experience. They knew how 
how easily provoked he was, how thin-skinned he was. So Hannibal took on the coldest day of the year, the winter solstice, basically December 21st, 22nd. He took 2,000 of his best men. He greased them up with pig fat because it was cold. He set them for an ambush on the, the west side of the river, but he sent his Numidian cavalry, the best in the world at the time, really mobile, and he sent them across the river at a, a place that they could ford, and he sent them to the Romans' camp, and they taunted Sempronius, the Roman general. I don't know what they said. We don't have that recorded, but they really got him angry, and he he just took all of his men out of the camp through the Palisades, and he didn't even give them breakfast. And it's the coldest day of the year. And the Numidian cavalry go back. They, they basically go back across the river. And remember, the horses can take the colder water up to their chests. They're uh, higher off the ground, obviously. But the Romans are mostly infantry. And what the Numidians did they forced the Romans to cross in the worst possible place. Ice. And here, here you're seeing where Hannibal hit his ambush over here. That's looking west. So he puts 2,000 over here. And then this is the kind of condition. Uh, weaponizing nature. Hannibal made the Romans cross the freezing Trebia River. Ice flows, sub-freezing temperatures. Not, I mean, the water was slow and sluggish, full of ice. Can you imagine an army trying to cross this? Hannibal brought them to him through the freezing river. You can imagine their clothes, water soaked, freezing on them if they get through and get out. Those that didn't get, you know, that whatever, totally immobile. They were so cold they could barely raise their arms at that point. And of course, Hannibal took total advantage of the fact that they were half frozen from crossing that river. Uh, and he, he, he basically had them come to him, to him and then his ambush swept in from behind that was on this side of the river. Uh, the Romans, uh, they lost 15,000 men in that battle that day. Some got through, the officers, Sempronius Longus himself got through. Uh, he basically uh, avoided the main battle. Uh, he was not battle ready, uh, and he went back to Placentia. Uh, and you look at this, this is sort of a diagram that says a little bit of it. It's not quite right, but they crossed the freezing river. It took out their uh, essential uh, army readiness. Uh, and then Hannibal came with his ambush behind. And that was a huge defeat for Rome. 15,000 captured. Hannibal gathered all the weapons and army he could. He ransomed the officers back to Rome if they could raise their own ransom, but it was a slaughter. And Rome couldn't understand. Sempronius went back to Rome and reported it was the weather. Well, yeah, weaponized by Hannibal, the freezing Trebia River. So that's the first time that Hannibal, after learning through the Alps how tough wintry conditions can be, losing so many of his own men, and now he's trying to beat the Romans quickly because he wants the Celts to come over to his side, and this worked. Most of the Celts in northern Italy went over to Hannibal's side after this. Now, the second, uh, uh, the second battle, a year later, Hannibal had camped through Italy, marched through uh, some of these valleys, uh, uh, and uh, the Romans had a different general, now Flaminius, who was just like Sempronius Longus in the sense that he was vainglorious and egocentric. He thought he could take Hannibal down quickly. Uh, so Hannibal camped, now this is the Lake Trazi men. You can see these hills right on the Northern side, you're looking North, uh, and Hannibal camped inside this little valley here. And Hannibal now at summer solstice, and Hannibal again used the circumstances of nature and climate uh, uh, to help him uh, and against the Romans. What happens in the Bay Area, we know quite often, when warm air meets cold air, we have fog. And that's exactly what settled over the Lake Trazimen Lake that summer morning. Hannibal hides in these valleys, hides his men in the hills in the fog, and then the Romans come out after him the next day. This is Flaminius's camp uh, here, just outside this little narrow valley. 
that's along the lakeside. Hannibal's got men hidden all in these hills. He draws the Romans to him. Uh, he makes sure at first they can see him in the fog, and he just starts backing up to bring them into this ambush, this trap, and it worked. Again, 15,000 Romans are slaughtered, 15,000 or so captured. The few that, that come to their aid the next few days get taken out by uh, his Numidians, Maharbal. Uh, so Hannibal wins again a second major battle using this time fog to hide in. So weaponizing nature. Uh, uh, we're told that even Flaminius himself was decapitated. Now, the uh, Roman Arezzo Superintendente has excavated this area and found indeed lots of skeleton that are Roman, but again, no weapons because Hannibal gathered up all the weapons and armor. That's expensive stuff, but he has something in his mind he's going to do with all this stuff. Uh, you may anticipate where this is going to go. So that's the second major battle a year uh, later, 217. So 218 Trebia, 217 Trazi men. And then he basically runs all through central Italy for quite a while. And the Romans decide they put a, a dictator in charge, meaning one who has military authority, kind of imperator, Fabius Maximus, an old veteran, whose nickname was Cunctator, the delayer, because his policy, Fabian policy, is avoid battle. So he didn't want to fight Hannibal after those two disasters, but he finally thought he had Hannibal trapped in Campania. Hannibal would come down across Italy, back and forth. He took all the farm food, all the vegetables, all the grain, all the cows. In fact, he left one uh, farm alone, uh, this is the Trazimen battlefield, by the way, where that, that the second one, the lake one, and you know what's bad? Even after 2,000 years, that stream is still called the bloody stream that feeds the lake, the Sanguinetto. But now here we are in Campania. Hannibal's down here taking all the cattle and the food, and he's going to go back east across this pass we think is the Caliculus Pass. Well, Fabius Maximus, the Roman general, thinks he's got Hannibal trapped. There's only one little narrow pathway uh, over those Apennine Hills, right about here. Uh, and he's not going to go north. He's going to probably go east. They think they've got him trapped. They've got it lined up with Roman army all along these hills. Fabius Maximus thinks that Hannibal's going to wait out the night. Well, Hannibal did something really tricky. Uh, this, by the way, is what that looks like. And those are where the Romans flanked these hills on all sides. That's a picture I took. It's called the Falernus Agir, the field of the Falernus, uh, and uh, the Volturnus, uh, we could call it today. Hannibal's waiting out, but that night he tells his men, look, we're going to bed early. We're not going to try to cross this pass in the daytime. Uh, the Romans will see us too, obviously, and they'll, they'll close off that little pass. But gather all the firewood you can find. Gather all the dry firewood. Put it together in this big pile, and I want you to go to bed early because we're getting up in the middle of the night. What Hannibal did that night was he tied wood between the horns of the cattle, he lit it, and he sent them up this way. And that's what the Romans saw. They thought that was Hannibal's army. The cattle uh, running with fire between their horns, burning, they were all uh, just running akimbo. They were running chaotically, but their, the, the Hannibal's uh, soldiers kept the cattle in, in place with prods and forced them up that way over the pass. And the Romans chased the cattle thinking that was Hannibal. And they all left the pass open and Hannibal went over that night untouched. So he tricked the Romans this time using the cover of darkness, night, nature as a weapon. Pretty brilliant. So, uh, you know, Hannibal does it again and again and again to the Romans by figuring out how to use nature to his advantage. The Romans thought these were soldiers with torches. Uh, did they not hear the mooing and the, the cows? Well, they didn't figure it out. Uh, and Hannibal knew that Fabius Maximus, the delayer, wouldn't attack him at night, but they chased the cattle thinking that was Hannibal's army. 
So Hannibal uh, was right. He understood his enemies. He got into their heads. He had the best military intel that, that Iberian silver could buy again and again. And so now let's go to the last battle, uh, that his great victory at Cannae. If you've ever noticed that uh, the Sahara, this vast desert, has this Labecchio dust storm that can blow off from Africa into the southern Mediterranean. And I've been on boats and ships around Sicily during the times of year when these dust storms can happen. And it's so bad, it can pit uh, a windshield of a boat uh, when fiercely blown by these winds, these huge uh, pressure zones that change. Well, it's blinding dust, I guarantee you. You, you. The grit, you can't see when it's blowing and you're facing it. So Hannibal's gonna use this as a weapon. Now here's Sicily and right here, uh, this is the area of Calabria and a little further north of that, just above this picture is the battle zone of what we call Cannae. Uh, today, there's a little hill there. There's a monument on that hill to Hannibal quoting Livy. Uh, and you're looking across the battlefield here. Now today it's a big vineyard with the, uh, what was then the uh, Ophidus River, now it's the Otranto River, hemming in this valley. And Hannibal knew the Romans finally are gonna come to him because he's taken their major grain supply at Canusium. He took it to supply his armies and he did it to provoke the Romans who were leaving him alone for the most part they're avoiding battle with him, but now they have to come. They put 10 new legions together. That's about 80,000 soldiers. They were so desperate, they clean out the prisons and lowered the age of fighting to 16. Uh, there, you know, because Hannibal decimated two standing armies with two bad generals, uh, Sempronius Longus and uh, Flaminius. Uh, so now this battle is going to be met with 10 Roman legions led again by two officers, the military veteran, who's Aemilius Paulus, and the, the political uh, leader, consul, uh, Terentius Varro, who again, like his predecessors, uh, Lo Sempronius Longus and, and Flaminius, he's a hothead, he's impulsive, he's overconfident, not the military veteran, Aemilius Paulus. So Hannibal brings them and he chooses the battlefield in this narrow valley, it doesn't look that narrow, but it's a river flanks it on one side and this hill on the other. Uh, the Romans are compressed in this valley and Hannibal even polluted the Romans water supply with uh, uh, carcasses of animals. So again, his stratagems uh, were very effective. He chose the day, it was a very hot day, but he chose the day when that wind is blowing from the south. Hannibal chooses his position. He's facing north with the wind at his back. The Romans are facing south with the wind and the sand in their eyes. Uh, this is the battlefield. Now I've crisscrossed that battlefield enough. Uh, you know, sometimes you see whitened bones there, but I've never encountered so many flies in my life. And you can see where the line of trees are. That's the Alphidus Otranto River right there. So he forces 70,000 soldiers in this narrow valley compressed. There's no graphic that can show it that well. I'm standing on the hill looking north into that valley, the Cannae Valley. valley. And so th uh, this picture is better if you had it facing more to the, if the Romans were facing south instead of southwest and the Romans, uh, sorry, the Romans facing uh, south, Hannibal facing north. Uh, I don't think the battle happened exactly. I think it happened a little slightly further uh, over here, uh, but it's okay that it's still a compressed battle zone. The Romans probably had 10,000 in their camp. Now what Hannibal does, uh, there are two contingents of Roman cavalry. Uh, on this side, the one led by the veteran Aemilius Paulus. On this side, the one led by the political officer, hothead, uh, um, you know, the impulsive one, Terentius Varro, who doesn't have the military experience. And the skirmishers come out first uh, and P Hannibal puts his Celts and his Spanish here. And then he has his two cavalries on the two sides. And then he has uh, Numidians and other soldiers, Spanish soldiers here. 
and African troops. And what he does, hidden behind the lines, he has two battalions dressed up like Romans from all that Roman armor that they had taken from Trebia and from Trasimene. The Romans don't see them. But Hannibal sends out his skirmishers, and he has an, an interesting group. So the Romans are massed in this dust storm at Cannae with the sand in their eyes blowing, mostly from the south and southwest from Africa. Hannibal tells his slingshot bearers, he has a troop for the Balearic Islands. They're really good with slingshots. They can take down a goat if needed at 200 feet. So he says, see that guy over there in the big red cape, the cavalry officer? He knew that was the veteran Aemilius Paulus. He says, take him down with their slingshots because they were the, the vanguard troops. They were close enough. Can you imagine a thousand slingshot you know, ball ballistae coming at you? And they wounded Paulus so severely, they took him out of commission, out of battle. Now he's still there but they took him out of commission. So who are they facing now? They're facing the not military veteran, but the political appointee, the consul who's a demagogue hothead uh, and doesn't really know how to fight. This is critical. Hannibal then pulls back his center. He pulls back this center here, pulls it back, pulls it back, pulls it back. The Romans fall into the trap they come all the way through here, and, and then by pulling back so far back to here, leaving these two battalions that look like Romans, the Romans fall right into that trap. And then Hannibal's cavalry chase off the cavalry of the Romans this way, and Varro flees the battlefield. The hothead political officer just abandons his army. So it's leaderless. The military veteran is incapacitated. The political guy flees, he flees as a fugitive and Hannibal brings his cavalry back and closes the box. And then these two Roman looking groups on east and west flanks start compressing the battle zone. The rest of them, the cavalry comes back, there's slaughter on all sides. And you can imagine most of the recruits for this battle are young and inexperienced. They had two weeks to train marching from Rome to here. They don't know what they're doing. And you might know fear, it just fear can incapacitate even further, the mass psychosis of fear. Hannibal compressed the Romans so that the only ones who are really fighting are on the outer perimeter. The others are too squished in the middle. And, and just line by line, Hannibal mows them down. Terrible day for Rome. Terrible day. Wow, uh, we're told that some of the soldiers, some of the Roman soldiers just, you know, just sat on the ground and cried until they were basically maimed or arms cut off or legs, you know, and that Romans didn't have the right weapons. Hannibal had probably the falcata, which is like a meat cleaver as well that the Spanish Celts had. That's what they look like. Uh, we had Dave Baker, a Hollywood sword maker, make one of these for our our Spike TV show, and we couldn't believe uh, how those swords can just chop uh, spines in half. Uh, we were using, you know, fetal formaldehyde pigs, but one blow uh, can break uh, right through the spine uh, of just about anybody with these weight, weight heavy blades in the front. Uh, they're, they're, they're like, as I said, like pikes. So Rome was decimated. 55,000 to 70,000 Roman soldiers were butchered in one afternoon. That meant one out of every five adult Roman males between basically 17 to 50. They lost 29 Roman tribunes, four generals. Uh, Varro escaped, but four generals. Uh, they lost a lot of senators who, who had been military veterans and patricians. Hannibal's men that day collected 200 gold rings on the battlefield of Roman knights. Robert O'Connell uh, says that more deaths on that battlefield at Cannae than any other day in history on a battlefield. 55,000 Romans butchered. Might be 70,000. We don't know for sure. Uh, uh, Hanson says 
Victor Davis Hanson says that there were 30,000 gallons of blood poured out on that field that seeped into the ground. Could you imagine the carrion birds that came, the vultures and whatever else came to pick at the bodies? Days it took probably some of those men to die if they weren't dispatched with, with mercy. Terrible. Hannibal had tricked the Romans again using both the confiscated weapons from the, true, the two previous battles, the heat and the, uh, the dehydration of the Romans because they couldn't get to their water holes. They were polluted by uh, carrion, by uh, animal carcasses, and the dust storm blinding them so they really couldn't quite see what was going on. And they couldn't distinguish those two battalions that looked like Romans but weren't. And Hannibal used, no doubt, bugle signals. He had a multicultural army. They didn't all speak the same English, but they were trained to listen to what the bugle said, the bugle peals. That day, I'm sure, when Hannibal used the bugles to tell these two contingents on the two flanks to start moving in. He, he, this is the box, the Hannibal uh, encapsulation that he was famous for. He controlled the battle by controlling the environment. He was outnumbered two to one. Uh, there's that old adage, though, uh, that uh, uh, a thousand men poorly led can easily fall to a hundred men wisely led. Well, Hannibal was outnumbered, but he made his secret weapon be nature, weaponizing the environment. That was the worst day in Roman history. After that, Romans would always say, Hannibal at the gates, Hannibal at the gates, they, to try to muster up uh, support. Later on, of course, Hannibal's student, who was the Roman Scipio, had learned all of Hannibal's lessons. And that's a battle I won't talk about today. It's in the book uh, that I wrote, how Hannibal trained the Romans to be better soldiers, because they changed their tactics after this. They stopped having two, two consular command, one being a political officer. Uh, they started training their armies vigorously to have more professional armies. Uh, they adopted a much, much stronger uh, mobile cavalry units. They learned all the lessons from Hannibal they needed to. And I would say, uh, as I have said elsewhere and in this book, that maybe the Romans wouldn't have conquered the world had Hannibal not schooled them first. Interesting. We cannot say. Notice you've heard this phrase before, that it's better to be loved than feared. Machiavelli said that. If you look at the context of book 17 and 18 of Machiavelli's The Prince, it's Hannibal he's talking about. The Romans feared him so much. Uh, so Machiavelli's talking about Hannibal with that famous phrase, that it's better to be feared than to be loved. Few people know that until they read The Prince closely and see this. So. There's that battlefield. And I told you there are more flies than I've ever seen in my life, swatting flies constantly, the times in this battlefield. Doesn't even matter the time of year. I think those flies came that day to drink up the blood and the, the, whatever it is that flies do. And they start breeding there and they've never left. It's a fly breeding ground, guaranteed. Now, you can see that it grows grapes. I'm sorry. Europe and wine country. I don't think I want to drink that wine. Yeah, 2000 plus years later, you know, all that hemoglobin is soaked into the, 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 the soil, but it's still, it's not a wine I would want to drink even today, so long after. Now, obviously if there's anybody in history I would like to have met, it'd be Hannibal, but I sure wouldn't want to go up against him in battle not the way he brilliantly utilized the environment as his weapon. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Patrick. That was really great. Well, um, you guys so, are a great society. Some of you oh, 
So there are um, there is a, a couple of questions. I know I have a question. Are you are you open to doing a couple of questions and answers? Okay. I turned off my slideshow though, so you know it's best to now just go without that. Okay. So the the first one, and I think let's see if we can understand it. But it's um, Michael Lee writes. I am trying to recreate Hannibal's route for a virtual fitness challenge group that I am running with. What is the closest thing to a city by city map route that has been created? Well, we, uh, we've created something of a route. If you look at chapters uh, nine and 10 uh, in that book, and you may be able to find it, you know, it may be uh, the Google books, books version. Um, uh, but you'd want to start out, roughly speaking, uh, around um, I would say uh, Modan, France, M-O-D-A-N-E, and go up over the Clapier. So you start at about 4,000 feet. And then in one day, Hannibal did this in one day. He went from 4,000 feet to 8,000 feet. And you'd go up, uh, you know, the, the, the route is pretty easy to, to follow as long as you don't push it too fast. We've actually seen people uh, run past us uh, on this ascent. And, you know, these were athletes with me. And, and they didn't like being passed by, you know, people. You know, athletes really, you know, <laughs> are competitive. But Joel, my good friend and guy says, nope, don't climb too fast because you want your blood to oxygenate. You want your red blood platelets to start carrying more oxygen. You can't do that if you do... 4,000 feet too quickly. This is what climbers know. Uh, and one occasion we did this and this guy, you know, kind of sneered at us, ha ha ha, passed us by. Well, by the end of the day, he was dead. The helicopter came and, you know, picked him up at 9,000 feet because he thought he was macho and climbed too fast. Now he was not in good shape either. so. You know, being in good shape is part of it. I have to stay in good shape for Nat Geo. Uh, so I walk seven miles a day. I climb uh, 10 or so hills around us here on the peninsula. I climb a minimum of 30 flights a day. Uh, and, you know, I'm not a youngster. So I have to do this. I have to stay in shape. But uh, you could go from Modan all the way to Val de Sousa, where Hannibal probably came down. We did it in one day. It's 22 miles. Uh, but but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, do it all that far. I would camp overnight at that site, the Col de Clapier, uh, which uh, really, as I said, it's a mile long and and almost two thirds to three quarters of a mile wide. And there's that lake, that alpine lake, uh, that has continual streams running running down freshwater streams. Of course, you have to watch out for you know Guardia and other bacteria. But it, this is doable. Uh, and we've done it every year until, I guess, a couple of years ago um, uh, with National Graphic funding, AIA funding, Stanford funding. And, um, you know, if, if Mike Lee wants to, I can send him an itinerary and I give him names of people he can talk to. Uh, I think Joel Blay has probably retired now, but there are other guides who know this route too. And you come to the town you go through Brahman, B-R-A-M-A-N-S, just before you start the real climb. And they have a huge sculpture of an elephant outside the town because I think it's the right place and they do too. Was that too long an answer, Nikki? No, not at all. I was just gonna say, um, if you're still there, Mike, was it Mike that asked the question, please? Um, Put your info in the chat, or, or I think Patrick, your your email is is on um, the AI website. If somebody yeah, yeah. wanted to reach you, it's really easy. P Hunt at Stanford.edu. Okay, hopefully everyone heard that. Um, there are a number of questions that just came in, so um, both in the chat and the, the question and answers. So. Um, R.K. DeBoer asks, did Hannibal had en have any out of the ordinary military training? Yeah, it's a good question. I didn't go into detail, but his father trained him from 10 years old on. And, you know, his father was the best general of the day. Uh, and you can imagine, 
uh, that uh, Hannibal, if you're an ad a pre-adolescent to, uh, you're, you're basically end of your adolescence. Hannibal, after his father died in an ambush, some say protecting his children, his three boys, uh, uh, Hannibal, Hasdrubal, and Mago, uh, he, he basically became himself the decoy for this ambush and led the ambush away from his sons. Uh, Hannibal was then declared the leader of the Carthaginians in Spain at about age 20. So for, for starting from youth onward, Hannibal was probably better trained than about anybody. And he learned, uh, as I said, from his father the best. So uh, he learned later, of course, that war elephants aren't the best things to have in the field. The Romans found a way to get around them, Scipio. Uh, basically uh, took Hannibal, a page out of Hannibal's book and used all of Hannibal's tactics against him at the very end at the Battle of Zama in 202. Patrick, I think I'll uh, go for the next one here, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, this no, is sure, a, Michelle. All yeah. right, wonderful. Um, this is a name I recognize, Philip Chilcote. And he wants to know, do you think that Rome's defeats in the Punic Wars had any uh, influence on the Marian reforms? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, they're essentially, uh, you know, you know, you're talking a, a more than a century later, uh, but yeah, some of the Marian reforms were definitely military reforms, uh, and uh, as I said, under uh, the civil wars uh, between Marius and Sulla, and then later on with Julius Caesar, who basically learned a lot. I mean, Julius Caesar crossed the Alps in Hannibal's footsteps and Julius Caesar had read Hannibal's accounts. So Julius Caesar learned from Hannibal and essentially every general sense has. Charlemagne did, Belisarius did before that, uh, Napoleon did. Napoleon crossed the Alps five times with five different armies because he wanted to cover all his bases, you know, following Hannibal. There's even a famous engraving with uh, a rock on the one of these passes that has the name, you know, uh, you know Hannibal. Then it says after that, you know, Charlemagne, Carlomagno, and then it says Bonaparte. So everybody followed Hannibal, including uh, Napoleon's competitors, the Austrians uh, and the Russians, uh, and even into the 20th century, many generals have emulated Hannibal. Patton, of course, famously tried to you know, create Hannibal's envelope. And later on, even Schwarzkopf uh, studied Hannibal. So Hannibal is taught in all the war colleges. Uh, my book is in the, well, in the St. Petersburg uh, Russian Naval Academy library. And it's also, you know, it's, it's taught at West Point at Annapolis. I teach Hannibal when invited to the U.S. Naval War College. And when you study the Marian reforms and when you study the Roman army after Hannibal, it's hugely different. So I think the answer is yes. All right, that was wonderful. A little um, too long-winded, perhaps. Oh, no, no. Um, how about um, this next one that just came in from Glenn Fallow? Um, and he wants to know, how long did Hannibal have use of the elephants after crossing the Alps? That's a good question. That's a good question, too. They survived that winter. And then uh, we don't know how many survive. It appears that only a couple elephants survive into 217. And Hannibal rides on one, his favorite, Polybius tells us, Suras, through the Apennine marshes. Uh, but the marshes may have done all those elephants in. We don't think the elephants, we don't hear about any elephants at Lake Trazimen battle in 217. And we don't hear about any elephants at Cannae. Only at Zama, when Hannibal's forced to come home to Carthage to Africa with recruits, his soldiers are too old to be veterans now. He has no elephants left and they give him 80 untrained elephants at Zama, which the Romans take full advantage of turning against Hannibal. He's got raw recruits, everything Hannibal had going for him uh, before he's lost all his advantages and his Spanish silver and everything else by 202. You know, he ran around Southern Italy for a good decade 
uh, without any reinforcements from Carthage. So the elephants were not part of his uh, battle plans, probably after 217. This is fascinating. You, you have so many questions. You have many more questions than we have time for because we only have about five more minutes left on our Zoom meeting. But um, I have a follow-up question and I'm selfishly going to ask it because, <laughs> because I can. But um, I am really curious if anyone has ever found an elephant burial or elephant bones in any of the surveying or excavating. The only, the only elephant, yeah, that's a good question too, Nikki. Now, uh, in, in the 18th century, near my Mailan or Mayan, M-A-I-L-L-A-N-E on the Rhone River, uh, a farmer in Provence uh, was digging uh, a deeper cave for his wine. And he came across an elephant carcass, a whole skeleton. Uh, and this was 1788. And it had a bronze plate chained to its ankle, just like a name tag with Punic inscription. The elephant uh, skeleton, this was published in the Cahier de Provence, 1788, as a small paragraph. I've been to Mayan, I've been through their archives, I've been to, the it disappeared. The, the total elephant skeleton disappeared. Maybe it's in some natural history museum, but I don't know. However, as I said, the only bit of an elephant that's turned up whatsoever in the Alps is below our pass, the Val de Susa. One tusk, slightly charred. So there may have been other elephant parts burned with that. There, it was a burial, a deliberate burial uh, with other Punic material, but that's the only one. And it, it does reinforce our perception that this is probably the primary pass candidate for Hannibal. Good question. Well, thanks. <laughs> Great talk. Um, so I'm going to, I'll forward one more question to you, and then I think we'll wrap it up. But again, to everybody who has questions for Dr. Hunt, he's always willing, I know from personal experience, to field questions, talk to people. Um, so do take advantage of his, his email. I hope it's okay that I said that. I'm um, kind of obsessive about Hannibal. Right? Okay, Hannibal, good. So... Um, Bruce Stamba writes, any thoughts on why Hannibal never attacked Rome itself? Yes, uh, that's a really good question too. Uh, thanks, Nikki. And uh, th the perception always was that right after the Battle of Cannae, Mahabal, his Numidian general said, let's go to Rome. And Hannibal said, no, it's not gonna work. We're exhausted. Uh, Rome is minimum two weeks away for an army. Uh, uh, you know, we can't go there immediately, even though that their military leadership has been decimated, we cannot just suddenly start for Rome. We have to lick our own wounds and then recuperate and consolidate what we've got. And what Hannibal wanted was all of South Italy and those Greek colonies to come over to his side. And by and large, they did. That's what he really wanted. He wasn't after taking Rome. But later on, about 207, Hannibal was trying to draw the Roman armies away from Capua because they were, they were surrounding Capua, one of his headquarters. And so he decides to go up to Rome. Now, he takes an army up to Rome in 207. And I think he knew back in 216, after the Battle of Cannae, that Rome is surrounded with walls 50 miles around. And there's no way you can lay siege to a city with a, a wall 50 miles around it. The walls completely encircled the city. Even if he attacked the gates, uh, he would be at a great disadvantage to try to force his way through some of the gates. But he knew they had fresh water uh, there in Rome. Plus they had the Tiber River as one of their walls. I mean, it wasn't even, that, was, that wasn't even a part that he had to think about, the huge Tiber River. Havel knew he couldn't take the city of Rome at all. If, if at all, it would require some major, major, uh, you know, inside uh, force to open all the gates to different parts of his army at once. And in 207, when he got there, 
there were huge, huge, a week of torrential thunderstorms and rains. Now remember, Jupiter is the God who throws the thunderbolts, just like Baal. And I have kind of wondered if Hannibal thought his own God was suddenly against him. What Polybius calls Baal is Zeus, which is what the Romans called Jove or Jupiter. And, and, and there's no question Hannibal knows that this Jovian God also is the storm bringer, like his God Baal. Did he wonder if the gods had suddenly turned against him? Good question. That's a great question. That's a great place to end as well. I'm sorry I'm in the dark, everyone, but as you remember, I'm outside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Patrick, thank you so much. This was so great, as always. Um, well, fun. You just, you know what? If I wasn't already a bioarchaeologist, I would have said, you picked the best job ever. You definitely. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing all your adventures with us. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, and, thank you, Michelle and Nikki. Thank you to your okay. wonderful society and those always intelligent questions. Well, and thanks to everybody who um, got to listen to us while we were trying to figure out everything earlier. Sorry about that. Um, but we finally got it all set. And um, I hope everybody um, has a wonderful rest of your Sunday. And um, I don't know, make sure that you go and support AIA for us so we can get more people like Patrick to come and visit. Well, thank you. It's a privilege and an honor. Thank you. Patrick, Thank thanks, everybody. Good night. Stay safe. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.